Welcome to the SITREP Speaker Series. I'm Frank Thorpe, President and CEO of the United States Navy Memorial, and thank you very much for joining us. Before we get started today, a couple quick announcements. First, uh, congratulations to Carlos Del Toro, nominated to be Secretary of the Navy. We're looking for that uh, confirmation process to be complete and welcoming the Secretary here to the Navy Memorial. Second thing I'd like to talk about is uh, a new thing I'm going to do on sit reps here is we're going to recognize a reunion group. I mean, we do a lot of reunion groups here at the Navy Memorial. They come through and participate uh, in our uh, speaker series and visits. And we have a program called Stories of Service. And uh, today I'm going to recognize the USS Bang. If you go on our website, uh, Stories of Service talks about the USS Bang, a bunch of interviews we did with them, uh, SS385, a great group of people. And as a matter of fact, a bunch of them are watching today, and I'd like to, uh, to welcome them to the show. And the third announcement, a big announcement we've waited for for uh, more than a year, is it uh, looks like we're going to open the doors of the Navy Memorial uh, shortly after the 4th of July, so we look forward to uh, those of you in the area coming by and visit, and those of you out of the area, please come by and visit when you're in D.C. So uh, the first thing I'd like to do is thank our sponsors today. Uh, Navy Mutual Aid has again signed up to be a, uh, a uh, co-sponsor for the entire year. We literally could not do what we do without the support of organizations, companies like Navy Mutual Aid, great life insurance company, annuities, helping uh, sailors and Marines uh, in the past and in the, in the present. So let's get on with it. Uh, as you all know, that today's program is live, interactive, on the record. Uh, you can see on your computer screen there that you can ask questions during the program, and our guests will be taking those questions. As you, as you see the, the questions, you can notice that you can like the questions. And the, the more questions, uh, the more likes a question gets, it floats to the top on my iPad, and I'll be asking, uh, asking our guests uh, those questions that float to the top. So let's get right into it. Uh, we're honored today to have Vice Admiral Jim Kilby with us today. Uh, everybody knows Admiral Kilby is a, a destroyer guy, six tours on destroyers and cruisers, uh, commanded a destroyer, commanded a cruiser, uh, commander of the Carl Vinson Battle Group, and is currently the Deputy Chief of Naval Operations uh, for Warfare Requirements and Capabilities. Admiral Kilby, I know you're busy. Thank you very much for joining us Thanks today. Thanks for having me. So I'd like to get right into, uh, into it, but first I'd like to talk about the scope of your responsibilities. Sure. Um, in the last decade or so, there's been some reorganization in the OPNAV staff and all that, and so tell us a little bit about what you're doing, and, and maybe it might be helpful after you do that. Tell us about your last two weeks. Sure, sure. Uh, for those who, who were associated with the Navy probably 20 years ago, we had an eighth, and the eighth handled resources and requirements, and now the Navy handles resources, which is Admiral Kreitz's job, the eight, and nine is requirements, that's my job. So there's a couple facets to that. I have, I have three, um, four principal folks who work underneath me, and they're directors for their respective warfare areas or communities. So General Odom, uh, just a newly reported uh, director, N95, Expeditionary Warfare. Uh, Paul Schleiss, uh, Surface Warfare Officer, N96, so he's responsible for all uh, cruisers, destroyers, combat systems, et cetera, and their munitions. Uh, 97, Admiral Bill Houston, that's undersea warfare, submarines and, and undersea vehicles. And then finally, Admiral uh, Greg Harris, call sign Hi-Fi, uh, is going to be relieved by Admiral Lozell at the end of this week. He's N98, and that's uh, air aviation warfare, air warfare. There's a couple other elements too. There's a, there's a guy named Admiral Jimmy Pitts who is N9I, that's my old job. He's kind of the integrator for all those uh, programs to make sure we're aligned and, and putting together the most impactful program we can for the Navy. There's a lady named Kelly McCool who runs the Digital Warfare Office and she's responsible for uh, some connection that I'm sure we're gonna talk about in this mm -hmm. uh, session. Uh, project Overmatch and really connecting N2 and 6 and N9 and, and we can talk about that as well. And then there's this new effort uh, fairly recently stood up by the CNO, uh, unmanned camp uh, the Unmanned Campaign Plan. So we're going to have an unmanned effort akin to Kelly McCool that's responsible for our unmanned efforts in the Navy. Uh, and finally one other element, N94, is uh, Rick Quaid and he's responsible for our a test and evaluation funds and is a, work for, is a resource sponsor for ONR, which is our naval research arm. So a couple different camps there. But uh, in managing all those programs, that's a, that's, a, that's a big job. There's also this idea that we will in, uh, approve our requirements in alignment with JSITs. So that's uh, a small shop under Admiral Pitts. 
that kind of runs our programs through their uh, milestones, and we have a formal process to approve requirements, new weapons, new platforms, new sensors to uh, field our Navy. So that's kind of the macro view of, of the N9. So you're putting together all these programs, um, uh, primarily organized uh, platform type kind of thing. Um, and then it's, it's your job, quite frankly, to, to uh, put together the program uh, for the Navy uh, that go, then goes up to the Hill, which is pretty much where you've been spending the last couple of weeks uh, of your yeah. time. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, it's so it's interesting when an administration changes and you get guidance, you're trying to bi build the best program you can. I really, Admiral Kreitz is responsible for the, the POM process as we know it. But uh, nine and eight have a close partnership here on putting that program together. And, and there's supported and supported elements of that POM process that we put together through the, through the cycle. So we're just closing out now on the kill the lead part of these are the things we should procure and why. And then we'll go to Admiral Kreitz who will align the budget to that and then FMB who does the fine tuning before we pass it to OSD. So we're really in that final end game here of POM 23 and we're defending POM 22 up in the hill in our hearings. So at any given time, there's, there's three budgets going on, as you know. There's the execution year, there's the budget that's going to be approved, and then the budget you're building. So uh, we are in the final stages of putting together POM 23 now. So let's talk at the highest level here as we di dive into some things later on. $164 billion uh, is the budget, right? Yep. The Navy budget, just the Navy part of the Department of the Navy budget, right? For a, for a, a year. Yeah, for one right. year. Right. Um, how, how is that received on the Hill today? A lot of money. Uh, Afga we're pulling out of Afghanistan. It seems kind of quiet and peaceful. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that too. But how, how, is that, how, how was that budget received on the Hill? And, and more importantly, from your perspective, what do you think of that budget? Um, I think we have tried to, in the last four years I've been associated with the program, follow a consistent rubric, right? So first is Columbia. We have to get that right. That's a once in a decade or generation reestablishment of our portion of the strategic triad. So that's number one. Number two is this thing called readiness, which is an amorphous term, and the Commandant has done a recent article with the Chief of Staff of the Air Force on that. But to me, readiness is the training, the equipping, uh, the uh, logistical support, the maintenance of all those forces to have confidence. So that's a little harder to maintain because it doesn't have as many interested parties over on the Hill, but it is an important part to not uh, fund and field a, a hollow force. So mm -hmm. readiness is important. Let's be honest with ourselves about what we need to do to support our sailors. The second is capabilities, and I'm sure we'll talk about that. Mm -hmm. But to me, that's the introduction of new things that pace the threat. And capabilities could, could show up in a lot of different forms. And then there's capacity. Uh, and capacity gets a lot of uh, interest on the Hill. And in particular, it's going to get interest. Uh, it got interest for me with the Senate hearing last week. And it, and it will get interest with the, uh, the House in a, in a hearing I'm going to participate in on Thursday. So I would say, uh, depending on the recipient of or what, what that member is, is interested in based on their assignment on committees or their constituents, they are. Um, they view this as a as a budget that's going to be challenged when you look at our adversaries like mm -hmm. China, like Russia, like just the world today. So I think we will get questions about that. And the job of the nine is to put together this program that says this is the most valuable program we can field, based on that trajectory which we can't control the adversary and our ability to field new capability. So let's, <clears throat> let's talk about those choices that you and the Navy had to make coming into this. So Columbia has been very well defined as first priority, got to happen, any risk to the program is a strategic uh, problem. Um, this budget seems to take readiness uh, as higher priority and then lethality and uh, capacity uh, and put readiness in front. Um, why do we need to do that today? Why, why do we need a Nate? Why do we need to do that today? Uh, and why did you prioritize it higher? Sure, I think we've done well prioritizing readiness, especially over the last budget cycle. So I wouldn't say 
it's prioritized more emphasis over previous years. I think we're getting it better and better, but we have a ways to go to measure that. And readiness is the maintenance funding for my ships. Do I have that right? Am I inducting ships with a realistic expectation of what the package is to get them out on time? Am I, am I producing that package in time for that shipyard to buy those parts and have them available when that ship comes in? Have I scoped out the work right? So that's a constant challenge. And we're uh, challenged with submarine maintenance in public yards and private yards and, and ship maintenance as well. Because we've frankly demanded a lot of our fleet over the last 20 years. There's a high demand for the Navy. And I, and I hope we get a chance to talk about that. But there's other elements of readiness too that are a little more um, innocuous. Let's take training. How do I fund training that I'm producing a sailor, airman, submarine are confident in their capabilities? When um, it's becoming harder and harder to do that given the trajectory of weapons and systems. Um, before the show, we talked about the old days where I would fly a Learjet out to simulate a, a cruise missile. If I didn't act correctly as the operator and, and that uh, Learjet had to circle around and return home, I've lost a training opportunity. If I invest in a thing called live virtual constructive, where I can have simulated tracks stimulate that combat system of that ship or that strike group, I can repeat it over and over and over again, and I can increase the number of the adversary to match what I think I'm going to get, which gives me confidence. And sometimes we have capabilities we don't want to display live because there are tactics, techniques, and procedures we want to protect. So I can do that in a secure, a virtual environment. So that's a key investment that's equally important with the new weapon system or the new platform or the new sensor. So we have to balance those investments. And sometimes that's a significant investment because I've got to update my ranges to allow me to do that live virtual constructive training. So that's been an emphasis area for Admiral Grady over the last uh, couple of years. And it requires operator intervention to not uh, maybe mischaracterize that and have it fall below the line. So it's got to have a champion, advocacy, and we've got to look at it uh, dispassionately and say, what do I need to do to feel that capability? So there are trades all the time and investments. Shipyard infrastructure optimization plan. That may not affect me today, but it will allow me to fight in the future. Mm -hmm. So I'm recapitalizing some dry docks that I haven't for 100 years. Mm -hmm. I've got to make that investment. And it's not sexy, and it doesn't necessarily buy this thing. But if I don't do that, I won't be able to maintain those submarines or ships in the future. So that's the balancing act of all those things, and that's the readiness funding we're talking about that's critical. So you asked to touch on it. Let's touch on it real quick before we talk about capacity and lethality. Um, the high demand today. I mean, uh, the choice you're given, your organization's given between today and the high demand, and maybe calling a timeout, um, like some people wanted to do during COVID or something sure. like that. Timeout. Um, talk to me about how the high demand on the force today and the impact that's having on the decisions you're making. Yeah, the system we have set up is a system where service providers try to answer the bell for the combatant commanders. And of course, they create operational plans for their theater based on the conditions they see. And, and those combatant commanders aren't constrained by resources. They want to ask for the forces they need to execute their mission. And so uh, that results in, in uh, requests for forces to the Secretary of Defense, which are granted or not granted or adjudicated by that staff. So there is a high demand for the Navy. The Navy is uh, unique. We are mobile. We don't have to uh, request access to your base or, or your structures. We can reset ourselves in a way uh, that is sustainable with our logistical train over time. So there's some inherent value of the Navy. And we're not a garrison force. We're a forward deployed force. So understanding that value proposition in itself to be there when it matters is something the Navy and the Marine Corps team provide uh, our, our uh, fleet commanders and our combatant commanders. And we train in many different missions. So we may train for one mission set based on what we think we're going to uh, encounter. But we can pivot that strike group to another theater or another combatant commander or execute another mission because we're there and we're trained to do it. That's a value proposition for the Navy. It's expensive. It's hard to train. 
and it requires a, a, a system called OFRP now to produce that readiness and aggregation of those force elements uh, to do what they need to do. So um, I, I think that's the balance we're talking about here and, and what we've got to be clear on because we don't know when something's going to happen. I don't have a crystal ball. I can, I can opine, but our job is to create this flow that allows us to transition to force to be equally more capable in the future and at the same time meet the demand signal of today. So that's why there's that tension between all those elements that we discussed and trying to feel that capability. Mm -hmm. So let's go uh, to that question that, that probably just frustrates the heck out of you, the number of ships. We got a question here from uh, Mike McKinney. Uh, uh, since the Navy has apparently given up on the 500 ship Navy, what number are we looking at? And, and maybe if you could talk about numbers, but, but also your thoughts on, on, on what that number, what having a number means. Yeah, uh, a number's good. It's a goal. It's the most simple thing that people can grasp when they're arguing for more or less. But I think a deeper conversation is the composition of those forces. So right now, the, the topic in the press and has been for some time is number of ships, which is important, and quantity matters. But the effect I bring from the air wing, the effect I bring from my submarines, the, comp the, the um, uh, synchronization of those things from a fleet commander level is a tenant of distributed maritime operations. So I just can't talk about ships in isolation and not talk about those other contributing factors because they play in that aggregation of that force. So that's probably not a satisfying answer. I, I say, I'll say, say what I said in front of the Senate last week. We've done a bunch of force structure assessments in the last five years. All of them say we need a greater Navy. 355 ships is the floor, I think. I want to transition that conversation to what is the force mix and what can the nation afford to feel to make our Navy more capable. And that's this concept of a hybrid force, which is uh, unmanned platforms operating with manned platforms in a distributed manner to give our fleet commanders and our combatant commanders options. So that's something we need to go after and transition our force uh, to that level. Um, last week we had a very successful event with an MQ-25 and an F-18 uh, where we actually passed a fuel uh, to that fighter. That's a significant event because where the aviation community wants to go is take fighters out of the refueling business and let these MQ-25 Stingrays do that fueling, which will increase our flexibility, our endurance, our range. So to me, it's that mix of capabilities that's important because I, I don't think about the fight as ship versus ship. It may be that way, but I may choose to, if I'm a fleet commander, attrite that uh, surface action group of the adversary with aircraft or submarines or something else. So it's the composition that matters. I, I don't want to be Pollyannish about this, though. Numbers matter. And when I decrease the number of ships I have, I decrease my ability to distribute across the globe, and we are a global Navy and have been for a very long time. So there is a mix there. It's just about uh, capabilities versus platforms. Uh, you know, when Ensign Kilby started out, I was on a ship called the Samson, and we had a hydraulic launcher. We transitioned to Mark 41 VLS, Vertical Launch System, which is a very um, uh, versatile, uh, it requires maintenance, but not like that a hydraulic launcher did. And I can use a lot of different munitions in it. And I've evolved munitions over time. You know, we have an SM-3, an exoatmospheric missile. We have an SM-6, which is actually as large as that missile, very capable. We have many other things we can put in that launcher. So I've evolved the capabilities of that ship, which allows them to be pace the adversary. So I've got to create systems that can be modernized either through new introduction of new weapons or the ability to receive a new platform. So that's kind of this capability capacity match. And when I've exceeded the ability to update that platform, then I need to pivot to a new platform and a new mix potentially. So that seems to be your biggest challenge, perhaps the Navy's biggest challenge, is when you make that pivot, it's an expensive capital investment pivot. Um, so we look at what you're doing with DDG 1000 and, and, um, and you know, not getting rid of the, the VLS tubes, but adding other, other tubes. Um, so no matter what we're talking about here, you, you talk about the significance of uh, unmanned aerial refueling. Um, 
how do you, what do you mean by that significance? I mean, I, I'd like you to go two different directions there. One, you talk about the significance to the aviation community because sure. they can put more uh, fighters in the air now. What's the significance to, for the Navy to be able to do that in short order moving forward um, with the CNO's mandate uh, by the end of the decade? Yeah, so just to be specific on the CNO's mandate, I want to have confidence in these mm -hmm. unmanned platforms to supplement my manned platforms in a thing we call manned and unmanned teaming to create a greater aggregate force. That's what the CNO's out for. Mm -hmm. And uh, he charged me about a year ago to look at this, and we took about, I don't know, three or four months to look at the State of the Union, and we found out we were, not surprisingly, very platform-centric and doing things kind of in a silo. So we've got a lift up a little bit here and manage these aviation platforms, surface platforms, submarine platforms or undersea platforms in a more uh, consistent manner where I'm not making multiple investments in the same thing. So let's take an aviation platform that has to do some degree of sense and avoid. If I have one program and one vendor, I will probably choose different ways to do that sense and avoid, which means I have potentially different outcomes. I don't know if I want that. It doesn't mm -hmm. seem to be, it'd be an efficient way to do it. So if I can have a, more of a hybrid approach and use the DWO model, Digital Warfare Office model, and have someone watching all those platforms looking for opportunities and saying, you don't need to do that. We're going to provide your sense and avoid package. Here it is. And, and introduce it in that manner, I think we'll, we could be more effective. But it's going to require a lot of effort uh, to do things differently than we have in the past. So I think it's key, though because uh, unmanned allows me to exceed the endurance of a human in the air. It may allow me to send a surface platform in the areas I wouldn't want to send a ship because it's attributable. I'd rather use this unmanned thing than, than hazard the payload, which is the human life. So how I build that into my con ops and con amps is an important part of this foundational work that CNO is talking about. We recently did this integrated battle problem off San Diego, uh, probably six weeks ago now, where we introduced a host of new technologies in a very experimental uh, manner. It was under the command of Admiral Khan, Third Fleet. He had a strike group commander, Jim Aiken, who ran the exercise, four pack fleet, where they introduced a host of new technologies. And oftentimes, when you put something in the hands of sailors, you, you find a different purpose than it was originally envisioned for. Yep. So we got some of that in that. So we've got to do more of that and turn that back quicker into the system. That's what the CNO is looking for, I think. So uh, one question before we go to break and, and uh, platforms and, and uh, capabilities. Um, Admiral Jim Seferi is out with a book 2034, um, which, uh, spoiler alert, starts with uh, three Ali Burks going to the bottom uh, involved in uh, FONOPS, Freedom of Navigation Operations. Um, uh, are you comfortable that the American people know how an incident like that can set off what was in 2034? Um, uh, debate whether it's called World War or not, but uh, but a, a, a series of, of events that cause a major need for the United States Navy to, to keep the commerce going. Um, or if you want to even be, go down the path of a cargo ship locking off um, you know, the Suez Canal. Um, are you comfortable that the American people understand the value of what you're talking I'm about? I'm not comfortable with that. Uh, I don't want to say we're a victim of our own success, but the Navy largely has operated outside of the public eye unless you're in the know for a long time. I think a contributed to that is we have an all-volunteer service, and what I used to say in my strike group command is 80% uh, of us joined because of father, brother, mother, sister, somebody was in. So we've kind of self-created this smaller and smaller ecosystem. And if there's not a forcing function to force the American public to acknowledge that, I think it's very difficult for them to comprehend it. It's, an it's a constant. They assume it's going to happen. They don't understand um, the complexity of it and the, and the effort it takes either fiscally or through dint of effort or those volunteer sailors to make that happen. So to me, I, I'm proud that it's not a burden on the American public. I'm, I'm curious on how, because we've tried to do this for a couple of decades, how do you get the, na the nation to understand the contribution of the Navy and really all the services to some extent, uh, but the Navy in particular because for the last 20 years it's been a little bit off camera 
because of what the nation has required us to do. It doesn't mean we haven't been involved in it. It just means it hasn't been as maybe as present as the Army or the Air Force or the mm -hmm. Marine Corps. But uh, there's some key tenets there that I talked about at the beginning, right? Maneuverability, flexibility, forward presence, the fact that we are out there and about, that's, that's hard to argue with, that that uh, ability to uh, interject the calculus of an adversary. You know, my last deployment, we were supposed to do something, and a third of the way, two thirds of the way through it, they're like, back up north. Mm -hmm. And so we presented a dilemma that had to be considered by that country. That's the value of the Navy. People forget about that as soon as it's over because we didn't have a catastrophe, thank goodness. Right? right? That's the challenge, I think. So um, I'm thankful for the series, and hopefully there is an element of the audience out there that isn't well-versed in the Navy, and they get curious about this because there's a reason why our founding fathers said build and maintain a Navy because we're a capital-intensive service, and you can't stand it up as quickly as you can an Army uh, yeah. just for the for for logical reasons. All right, we're going to take a quick break. Uh, when we come back, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the future. Uh, Fight you over match, uh, the Digital Warfare Office, we'll touch on that a little bit, and autonomous vehicles maybe. Uh, keep the questions coming in and, uh, and like them, and I'll, I'll continue to focus on the, uh, the questions that are coming in. Uh, stay tuned. We'll be right back. Doing the right thing is what matters most. But sometimes bad things happen. When they do, we all need someone who does the right thing. And that's Navy Mutual. The Lone Sailor, a powerful symbol of the sacrifice of sea service personnel, past, present, and future. For more than two decades, the Navy Memorial has placed 16 of these iconic figures around the country and the world. Now you can contribute to this story tradition and help place our next statue at one of the most significant battlefields of the 20th century, the D-Day beaches of Normandy. Be a part of history and help ensure their sacrifice is never forgotten. Make your tax-deductible donation today. Welcome back, uh, Admiral Kilby. Uh, let's jump right back into it, and uh, please keep these questions coming. Um, I'd like to turn, uh, as we said before the break, uh, about the future and arguably about lethality. Um, the Navy set, set up this digital warfare office, mm -hmm. and um, it, there's been a lot of talk about it. Um, but I'd like to, uh, not to be too Washington centric, but talk a little bit about the organization, because yeah, sure. it's different, and, it, and we'll build out of that into overmatch. Yeah, so there's been an evolution here. It started under Margie Palmieri, uh, who did great work kind of leading some pilots and understanding what this digital journey could look like for the Navy. We're at a transition point, though, where we've transitioned from that piece to what do we need to do to make our Navy more capable? That's the Project Overmatch piece. And so Kelly McCool uh, is leading that organization now. She is an awesome uh, addition to the Navy staff. She comes from Nav Air, so she's got an engineering background and has been assigned, aligned with many programs. So now she comes back onto the Navy staff with that, armed with that information, that experience on how to move the ball forward. So she is the resource sponsor for Doug Small, who is leading Project Overmatch for the CNO. Um, the key here is we've tried this many times, I would say, a handful of times in the last 30 years unsuccessfully. What's different now? A couple of things, I think. Uh, technology presents some opportunities for us with, with, uh, with the cloud and some uh, things like comms as a service and software-defined radios and other technological things that allow us to move to that next level. We've out-operated uh, ourselves for a long time with joint interface control officers and very technical, sometimes fragile links that require this high degree of expertise with a limited duty officer, we need to make it more robust, especially supporting this thing called distributed maritime operations. So 
all the services are, are running down this path. The Air Force is running. They started a thing called JADC2, now adopted and led by General Kroll and the Joint Staff. Uh, the Army's working on their version of that through an experimentation series called Project Convergence, which we're participating in. And the Navy is doing Project Overmatch. The key is that we are witting of each other as we move forward and don't make some decisions which preclude us from operating together. Um, we've been able to operate with our joint forces, but it requires a lot of effort. We want to make it easier to do that, seamless to do it. So Doug Small's initial instantiation of Project Overmatch is to try to um, open up opportunity that didn't exist before. So using this tin can with a string analogy, that's, I'm talking to you with that tin can and that string. What if I was able to just send that in information through a string to a communications roundhouse that had many strings in, in, uh, coming out of it, and I chose the best path for that information? And 10 seconds later, I could use another path for the same information. So I'm using my networks in a much more efficient manager, manage, uh, way to pass information. Acknowledging what our adversaries are doing. So I want to secure those networks with a higher degree. And maybe not be broadcasting information 360 degrees, but doing it in a more focused manner. So those are the opportunities Project Overmatch provides us. There is, there is a synergy with the unmanned effort and Project Overmatch that works one way. I don't need uh, unmanned to do Project Overmatch, which arguably I should do anyway, right, because we've tried to do it. I have to have Project Overmatch to get that confidence level with those unmanned systems because I don't have an operator in that aircraft or that ship or that uh, undersea vessel. So I've got to create this ecosystem, this technological ecosystem, where I can stimulate those things and have them act in a manner I want to whether to turn something on, to maneuver, to partner up with another uh, system. To me, that's what Project Overmatch is all about. That's not in our DNA right now, mm -hmm. right? We, we in the Pentagon, as resource sponsors, want to fund a program. And we are traditionally successful if we maintain or increase our money, and that program delivers on cost, schedule, and performance. This is challenging that narrative a little bit, because I've got to operate much closer with Admiral Trussler's folks in N2 and 6 because I'm delivering a weapon platform or sensors that's got to be inter-networked with other things. So there's a, there's a forcing function that is a little more driven than it has in the past to create this thing. We, we've been down this road a little bit with Navy Integrated Fire Control Counter Air. Mm -hmm. uh, we engineered a very uh, interesting capability uh, it requires alignment between four programs in the fun, from the sea pillar. Uh, but I'm not sure it's as robust as if we had done it from a project overmatch perspective. So that's what we're trying to pivot to. Uh, and we're trying to create the tools that allow our airmen, our sailors on ships, and our, our undersea submariners the ability to connect and understand what those other contributions are so we can station each other accordingly. Right? So I want to integrate. I don't want to just deconflict the fight and have it an air piece, a surface piece, and an under, undersea piece. Project Overmatch should give us that. But I have to have that central node in the Pentagon driving it above the fray, uh, which is why we have the Digital Warfare Office. So I don't want to sound parochial, and I know you've worked very hard, and the Navy currently is working very hard not to be parochial on this whole idea of, of, uh, of work fighting in the joint fight. It just seems to me to be more expensive, both from a hardware cult as well as culture and training perspective, to do what you're talking about doing, to take what, what I learned as network center warfare 20 some years ago into this idea that there's nodes that are in some cases deciding on their own where they're sending information. How, how have you been able to make those choices and what are the impact of those choices as you, as you walk down this project overmatch and what are you learning um, in order to create that confidence that CNO talks about. Yeah, so I want to I want to de decompose that a little bit. I'm interested in the effect, not the cost. I do care about the cost, but I want the effect because I want to aggregate this force in an impactful manner where we can do our nation's bidding as a Navy. But I suspect it's going to cost less or the same in the in the big flick because if I do this as I have explained in stovepipes. I think I'm paying for the same thing many times from many different vendors. Mm -hmm. 
So mm -hmm. if I can create a system where I say, program manager, you don't need to create that form function. I'm going to provide you that, that service. You just need to create a system that operates with that service. I think I'll operate better, and, and I don't think, and I think I'll have to pay for it once, uh, but certainly not every time. And then, worse off, have these things that can't communicate with each other because they've been created in a in a vacuum. So I think that's the necessity to do this. I don't, I don't know the, the cost piece. I'm interested in the output and what the aggregation is going to create. So it's a little bit of a nuance, but I do think we're going to do things more effectively and efficiently because we're managing that from a digital warfare office perspective. So think about the enabling capabilities for unmanned, right? I've got to have a ship that complies with Colrex. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. If I do it independently and go to this vendor A and vendor B and vendor C, they may have different ways to do that, which could create a variance in my force. Why don't I just say, you don't need to develop that. I'm going to continue to build this system, which evolves with time and understanding, and that's what I want you to operate with. I don't know that I want to do that every time, but I want to have the ability to do that now, and which requires this different uh, control approach. And that's why Admiral Moran and Trussler and I are lockstep on this, and General Smith, frankly, and Lori Reynolds. So it does require a lot of people to, to get around this idea and put their shoulder to the wheel. Mm -hmm. And what is industry's response to? I think to they're trying that? to understand it. I think uh, we've got to um, bring them along on this journey. There's certainly probably some resistance because it's not what they understand and it's not in the model uh, they're used to delivering things. But, but the nation is the customer here, not industry. Industry is providing what we need to do to create the Navy to bring that force to bear. And this aggregation creates us from building it the way we've always been, which is unaffordable. We can't afford that Navy. Our ships and aircraft and submarines are more complex than they ever have been in the past. So we've got to figure out a way to do this differently, and that's this hybrid force concept. So in, in this hybrid force, it, it, it is, it's a, it's change. I mean, it's different. It goes back to, you know, sure. we were chatting, the Navy I was in is not the Navy it is today. Um, so when you're talking network systems and artificial in, uh, intelligence and, and the, the systems you're putting together, you're driving decision authorities right. uh, in a very different direction. Potentially. We, we're not giving up weapons control, but yeah. I want that ship or that aircraft or that submarine to act predictably. You know, when it meets these rules of the road situation, I want to have confidence that it will act in accordance with the rules of the road every time. Maybe better than a human, because a human can misinterpret the rules of the road. So mm -hmm. if, I, if I do this correctly, it yeah. will do the same thing every single time. So, uh, but I think it's something we have to watch, right? We, we, we don't want to create a robot organization. We want to understand our way in that, which gives us that confidence level um, we're talking about in the future. So this, we're kind of touching on this autonomy piece, right? Yeah. How much autonomy? What autonomy? To do what? To what, achieve what end state? AI is the buzzword of the day. To do what, right? The Boolean logic in an Aegis system said, if that air contact is doing this, this, and this, it should be this ID. So I used Boolean logic to create drive to an ID. What if I use artificial intelligence to say, hey, look at all those things, and I want to see the thing that's not doing what I expect it to do. Like, hey, computer, look at all that chaff and give me that kernel of wheat. That's an opportunity for us that we should do in the future. But we shouldn't just say AI for AI's sake. We, we want to do AI to achieve an effect, mm -hmm. right? So there are many steps to get there before we get to AI. But I think the ability to do things more efficiently is key here. And in let's just take mind warfare, right? I used to have to drag a sweep set over some portion of the ocean and say, hey, I think there's a mine-like object there. Then I had to go back and validate it. Then I have to go back and neutralize it. Now I can do that with unmanned systems. I can take a Mark 18 a Mod 1 or 2, and I can drive it. I can mow the lawn under the ocean. And I can say, I can come back and take that tape, reduce that data, and say, hey, that's, I think that might be something. Send another Mark 18 Mod in your view. Yep, yep, that's something. Now neutralize it. That's a three-pass system. What if I could have a gang of things out there, and I could do this pass and say, oop, go look at this thing. 
I can cut down the time it takes me to do that and do it more efficiently and effectively. That's the promise of this, I think. So we've got to work through those things, those foundational enabling technologies to create the confidence that the CNO is looking for. So the CNO is looking for confidence by the end of the decade. Um, so let's talk timeline a little bit. It, it seems like the Navy's, uh, you, to use your term earlier, a victim of its own success. You know, you, you look back 40, 50, 60 years, you see ships and guns, uh, Battle of Midway. Sure. You know, and you go to today and people buy, you know, the next iPhone after they got an iPhone a year ago. So the expectation that you're going to be doing this, you're going to be hunting for mines like this tomorrow um, with a level of confidence to, 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 clean, uh, to clear a, a, a strategic seaway. Um, how do you deal with that, and, and both as you put together your programs as well as this confidence thing? And then what's the timeline that, yeah. that, you know, that we get to where we're actually doing some of this so stuff? So let's, we should acknowledge the goodness of the past because this isn't a cold start from, you know, now to forward. Uh, USS Samson didn't have an integrated combat system. It had a very, uh, a ship that had many different weapon systems that were integrated by the tactical action officer and watch standards and CIC. Then comes Aegis, it's an integrated combat system, but very mil-spec uh, costly updates to update the combat system of our Aegis ships. And then we separated the software from the hardware. So we can update the combat system much easier than we have in the past. So there's been this evolution that we've been on. H builds uh, for, um, for Hornets, DIS builds for E2Ds. So we, we're on this journey across all, ARCI for submarines. Every two years I create a new combat system and I call it the train. You know, there's a bunch of capabilities standing at the train station. The train pulls up. If you're ready, you get on the train. If you're not, you wait for the next train. So it's this ability to introduce capability in a more timely, rapid fashion. Now talk about new technologies, new digital technologies, new computer technologies. That will al allow me to increase that speed faster. So now maybe I can, through a digital twin, this concept that I can take the mm -hmm. Aegis combat system and put it in a PC, maybe update the combat system in a much more uh, timely manner than I could in the past. Thomas Hudner in 19 was doing a missile shoot, I think it was 2019, and she failed. She had a digital twin. They thought they understood what the problem was. They sent that tape back. They made a tweak to the software, and 24 hours later, they reproduced the shot and had a kill. Unprecedented. Unprecedented mm -hmm. because the software, the compute stack, allowed me to do that. So I want to decouple those things and talk about applications, not to use the overused iPhone analogy, but you download different applications all the time. In mm -hmm. fact, you're, you're told to, hey, mm -hmm. update me. So if we can get into that kind of system where I can introduce that capability faster, why wouldn't we do that? We'd be foolish not to do that. And that's the path we're on. So I want to, I want to separate those things. And then I want to introduce capability faster because I want to understand what the adversary is doing, acknowledge that, and reproduce that capability to counter it as quickly as I can. So there's, a, there's an element of being able to respond fast, right? And then, then there's an ability to look at my system and say, shoot, those, those ships are really expensive. Maybe I don't need as many large ships, and I need more smaller ships to have this distribution and effect. And maybe augmented by these unmanned ships, I can create a system that's more sustainable, especially in a theater that's challenging like the Pacific, where I can rotate an unmanned surface ship that's a, an, an adjunct magazine and keep the combat system and the ship there on station, where now I empty my magazine and have to send it back to a port to reload it. So different ways to employ the force to achieve the effect and increase my ability to stay in the fight. That's that's the, uh, the path we're going on. So, Admiral Kilby, there's a question here uh, uh, asking, do you see the Navy moving along the lines of mosaic warfare? And, and I'm not sure, I'm not aware of that concept. Um, advanced by General Deptula. Is that something that resonates I with I can't you? answer that question. I have to go, I'll take yeah. that one and go. Yeah, I don't, I don't uh, I'm not sure what that was either. Yeah. But, but uh, um, so, so let's talk back about uh, the pace you're on. Um, are we going fast enough? Um, you know, so I get the confidence, and, and it almost seems, you know, not that I would opine on CNO, but it makes sense to level of confidence by the end of the decade. Are we moving fast enough 
And when do we see, you know, the, your point about we're, we're refueling uh, uh, fighters F now. Sure. Um, when does that become the way we do business? When when does when do right. autonomous ships come out there? When are we mine hunting with uh, with autonomous? Yeah, vehicles? so I get this question from Congress, particularly about the MQ-25. So it's interesting how different folks react to um, new technologies. But Congress is very skeptical about unmanned surface vessels. Go slow, land-based testing. Don't 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 lose your lessons learned of the past. But in the air system, they're probably more confident because of what we've done as a nation for the last 20 years. So I get pressurized about, hey, when are you going to drop bombs from that MQ-25? When are you going to use it as a sensor? There is a vexing part of integration of an unmanned aircraft into the air wing. So one of the strengths of the United States Navy is the ability to co conduct sustained carrier operations. That's a dance. It requires a lot of people doing the right thing at the right time over and over and over again without communicating with each other because they just know their job. I'm introducing this big unmanned thing into that dance. So I've got to have that down. I've got to understand that. And then I've got to scale it potentially. Like the next logical thing to me could be, is it a sensor? Because mm -hmm. I, then I'm getting to the endurance, the crew endurance piece, mm -hmm. right? I'm creating a system where I take out all the payload required for people. You know, ejection seat, human living space, all the things I need to require. This is OBOGS, you know, which is my oxygen. Mm -hmm. Take all that out and use it for payload. So I've increased the effectiveness of that platform. As long as I can control it and it can do what it, I want it to do, then that's a reasonable thing to do. And we need to introduce increasing capability here, matched with complexity, to make that air wing of the future more robust. Because I'm getting pushed in range. So that endurance, that human endurance piece, is where I want to make sure I use all that real estate as judiciously as I can in the air wing perspective. Similarly with ships, if I don't have to create a galley, a birthing space, mm -hmm. I, all those things required for the crew, I can use that for other things and perhaps make that platform smaller but equally effective. But I have to have confidence in it, right? We, haven't, we don't have a clear track history recently with some of our programs because I think we went too fast. So we gotta, we gotta be measured, but we gotta go with a sense of urgency here and move forward uh, with, with Congress uh, allowing us to do so to introduce this naval force which is more capable. So that's the challenge of, of the, the nine job, is to uh, have a program, hit your marks, defend your money, not open yourself up for a mark which resets you and, and, and move ahead smartly here. So in the case of aviation, I see a lot of future in air wing of the future with a increasingly unmanned mix to manned ratio. And then we'll eventually get to those, potentially those complex things. And maybe, and maybe we, we don't. Some missions require a human to affect those unmanned platforms to create that aggregation. But we're, we're networking our weapons together in a manner we haven't in the past. We need to network our platforms together in a manner we haven't in the past. And we need to create the tools uh, to do that. And we got to get, get ahead of ourselves, Frank, because that's not our nature, right? So I've fought this fight about NIFCA battle, man <laughs> battle management aids for the last four years and have to say, I'm taking some of your money and I'm taking some of your money and we're going to do this because you're not going to do it on your own. And so that's the purpose of creating this greater Navy. That's the focus that we have to bring to bear every day because uh, this problem is not getting easier. So uh, great explanation of the aviation. I, I understand undersea gets a little more complex on a security classification um, on the surface. So let's just talk about one thing on undersea, which is interesting. When yeah. you walk around the airport, your cell phone switches networks without you having to do anything, right? Yeah. So that's Project Overmatch. I'm switching networks and service for that system and providing either that weapon or that platform the information it needs to do its job. I want to just leverage the airport analogy a little bit more. I want to be able to stop to the charging station, right? And I want to be able to charge my phone. I want to be able to charge that undersea thing in a manner where I don't have to surface it and allow it to sustain itself undersea, right? So think about that potential. That's hard to do. So take, take the iPhone analogy, perhaps to an extreme, and, but walking through the airport, 
I'm on the internet. Mm -hmm. I now shift to the airport Wi-Fi. I now go to, uh, 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 I'm now sending photos from one iPhone sure. to the other. That's overmatch right. for the United States. And you're not doing things. You're not saying right. shift in or shift to right. airport Wi-Fi. It does it on its own. Right. We're using technology to make that easier for you. Doesn't mean you have the same level of service all the time because you might go from a, you know, a 2G to a 3G to a 4G to ultimately a 5G or to Wi-Fi, but you're switching and able to communicate. I, I want to go back to one thing about the Navy. We can create our own network. I don't, it's great when I have satellites, it's awesome. But if I don't have satellites, I can fly an aircraft, an elevated sensor, uh, use a comms relay to help create my own organic network. I don't have to have satellites. It's better when I do, but I don't have to have them. And we practice that all the time in the Navy. It's in our DNA, right? So to use that data link from that elevated sensor is part of our ecosystem. And we, we train to do that. That's what our force generation system does. That's an inherent strength of the Navy. Yeah, so the questions are coming in here. With increased capability through digitalization, isn't cyber another threat to consider? So it is. You talk about creating your own networks. We go back to 2034 when suddenly they they can't talk to anybody, they can't see anything. Um, but you're creating. You're you're. What you're saying is you you're thinking through that. With with overmatch, you're thinking about. We want to create a secure network, yeah. right? We want to think through those things and understand them. And I would say. Um, we are on a we are we are awake mm -hmm. and aware of the threat here. Ten years ago, less so. So I think we've got to make sure we we think through that. But that is a warfare domain, and that's the part, Frank, about pacing the adversary. Right? You got to. They're not standing still. They're going to make moves every day, and we just got to understand, be winning of those, and update our pivot, our force to counter those things. And cyber is one of those areas for sure. Mm -hmm. Emma Kuby, we're running out of time. I think I have time for one more question. And I think uh, having watched you for more than a year in this job pretty closely, I think uh, it would be a not fair to ask you about the Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. um, uh, when you talk about integrating naval forces and uh, you and General Smith, um, I almost start to wonder whether your brother's from another mother at some point. Um, Talk to me about the Marine Corps integration as, as, you're, as you're talking. Going yeah, I, I think it's an opportunity and it's a strength of our naval service. We're foolish if we don't leverage that. Uh, one, of the, one of the pieces of kit the Marine Corps is uh, procuring is a Gator radar. Why can't I use that radar to stimulate my combat system and vice versa? The Marines are buying anti-ship cruise missiles. They are creating problems for our adversaries. What an opportunity. Right? I did a, a thing with, uh, not General Smith, but a, another Marine who said, we're flipping the script here. We're going to bring, we're going to hazard the sea. And so working together requires relationships, trust, and operating together. And we're doing that at the S2 level and below all the time. If you talk to Admiral Khan, he's working with his lateral in the Marine. Admiral Mers, he's working with his Stacey Clarity. You know, they're working together and creating those systems. We just have to keep doing it together at the S1 level where we align our programs to create that aggregate capability. And we should look for opportunities to do things in a more effective manner. So I shouldn't look at an unmanned vehicle for air and the unmanned vehicle for surface and say, oh, I, I have this requirement, you have this requirement. Maybe I need to give a little minor requirement so we can produce a consistent platform which allows us to operate better and more effectively and more efficiently from a cost perspective. So I think there is a lot of opportunity here. And we bring a, an aggregation of services which is unique and longstanding. And we should double down on that. But it's going to require things like uh, our programs to be synergized in a manner uh, that we haven't before, to exercise together in a manner that we haven't before, Frank. But I'm, I'm excited about it. And I think anything that makes life hard for our adversaries, we ought to double down on and do more of. So it seems to me overmatch uh, on the, the technical side, the Marine Corps, uh, the, the looking at lethality going forward, you're feeling pretty confident um, about the effects you're creating. Yeah, but again, I don't want to be 
will rest on my laurels here. We have some vexing adversaries, and we got to acknowledge that. Um, let me give you one more common example. NATO strike missile. The Marine Corps, Navy's buying it for LCS. Marine Corps is going to buy it for their Gabasm, which is a remote land vehicle that launches that missile. Mm -hmm. That's an opportunity. He, the Marine Corps could have gone in another direction saying we want our own missile, which creates its own problems. They're leveraging off the Navy doing that, so that's smart. Um, I feel confident that we're awake and paying attention to this. I think we need to continue to do that. We're not where we need to be um, because our, the, the slope of our adversary. Uh, Emma Gilday testified today. China's, the average age of a Chinese ship is 10 years. The average age of a US ship is 20 years. We got, we got to continue to watch that ball and be cognizant of that and understand and, and create what is our strength uh, through our operators, this system that makes it very challenging for the adversary to predict what we're going to do and, and counter it. I think on that note, we can wrap it up. Uh, unless there's anything else you want to... No, thanks for the on? opportunity. Again, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a great opportunity to talk about our Navy, our Naval Service. And again, I think uh, the problem is we're so into it, we often lose the ability to communicate about it. So. The maneuverability, the flexibility, and the sustainability, our sailors, are they're awesome. So to me, that presents a, a compelling package for the American people to consider. So thanks for having me. Well, thank you, Admiral Kobe. And uh, again, I haven't had a chance to watch you. Uh, thank you for today, but, but more so thank you for uh, the incredible uh, intellect and insight you bring into this job, which um, uh, I just can't imagine the, the complexity of the N9 and, and the reputation you've built uh, over the last couple of years doing this. And uh, so on behalf of a lot of us who, uh, who have been watching closely, thank you, sir, for, thank you, for sir. what you're doing. Thanks. So. And thank you very much for joining us. Thanks again to uh, Navy Mutual Aid for, uh, for being a sponsor for the series again. And uh, until the next time, fair winds and following seas.